Welcome to the Borough Life Podcast with James and Rosie. Every month we chat to local guests to celebrate the great things happening in and around Wigan Borough. Let's get started, shall we? Rosie, we're in a new studio today. We've got new surroundings, new tech. It's the same old presenters. It is, but what a great episode we've got coming up. So Rosie, who have we got coming up? So our first guest today is William Titley, who's a visual artist and he's really involved in our Northern Soul celebrations and he's bringing his piece of art, The Time Machine, to our new exhibition, which he'll tell you a bit more about as the podcast goes on. Great, and I'm over in the Sports Village in Lee to chat with Derek Beaumont, the main man of the moment. He is the chairman of Lee Leopards. It's been a huge few weeks for the club uh, with them overcoming Hull KR in the Challenge Cup final, then the amazing homecoming the, the, the next day, uh, thousands of people in, in Lee Town Centre. Um, so it's great to sit down with Derek and it was a privilege for myself and Rosie to be in the town for the homecoming. Rosie, it was, yeah, unreal, wasn't it? Yeah, we were right there in the thick of it. I was there in my leopard print with the rest of Lee. But it was fantastic scenes, wasn't it? There was just so many people, an absolute sea of leopard print. Yeah, you got the memo. I didn't, unfortunately. So, yeah, I let the team down there. But, yeah, it was great, wasn't it, to be behind the scenes and just to see everybody coming together for a momentous occasion. And we all have memories that will last for a long time. And, yeah, something just absolutely massive for the for the town and for the borough. So, yeah, the interview with Derek is coming up. Rosie, should we just get on with things? I think we should. Let's go to William's interview. Hiya, Rosie, James and Lydia. What a nice space you've got here. It's great, isn't it? You're, you're our first guest in this space. Re- really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, That's first incredible. time. I'm honoured. <laughs> yeah, so so I'm a, a visual artist working with uh, audio-visual approaches to working with communities, usually exploring like a sense of place and things. A lot of my research kind of evolves around that idea of a community in place being inseparable, difficult to kind of discuss one without actually touching on the other. So I'm, I'm kind of based at UCLan University of Central Lancashire yeah. as an artist researcher, only part time. And then the other half of my week, I do freelance projects, which kind of create art around the idea of community and place. You were just telling us before we started recording here, kind of your route into Northern Seoul. Could you talk to us a little bit about that and how, how you kind of found yourself, you know, doing this project in Wigan? Northern Seoul for me, I kind of heard about it just second hand really when I was a child because I was too young to go to the casino or Blackpool or wherever or Stoke. But a lot of my friends at school were into it and my older sisters, they were into it as well. So I the first I heard about Northern Soul were the pants, you know. My friend had these really weird flared pants on and, and in the gym at school he'd be kind of practising these these moves, these spins and claps and stuff and it just sounded really exciting and a lot of me and my other friends, we all tried to copy him but we couldn't do it. So that was the, the initial sense of what Northern Soul were from a, dis, a, a long distance really. And then through art really, I've been an artist for about 25 years and about 15 years ago I started working with various communities where I live in East Lanks and and one particular community was the Northern Soul community in that area and then more recently I deconstructed a 1976 rock hall, a jukebox and turned it inside out into separate components and I then asked people do they have any significant memories attached to particular records? And then the idea was to put the record into the machine, but on the on the jukebox control panel, if you will, where all the labels are of the songs, instead of having the, the title track, you have a condensed version of their memory attached to the record. So when you're making your selection, you can't actually, you don't actually know what record's going to come on until it comes on. And and what happens in the, in the space, which is something that, I didn't anticipate is when you've got a community of people who have inputted memories into it and records when they're interacting with it in the space I, I might for example be attracted to one called the smell of brut aftershave and I'll put that track on because of my association yeah. with that smell but when the actual track comes on someone else in the room might go oh well actually this this song reminds me of so and so 
he used to dance in this particular way. And so what happens is everybody's memories kind of get mixed up. Yeah. And, and you end up not being able to listen to that track ever again without the smell of brought or this other person's memory <laughs> merged into one. Yeah. So they're choosing seen. the memory then. That, that, that's the thing that they're clicking on the on the jukebox. Yeah. Yeah. They select, the they're selecting the memory. So it is about attraction to to someone else's memory rather than attraction to or a liking for a song yeah because you don't know what song's going to come on until yeah. you until you make the selection it's an immersive experience isn't it and, and, and there's more and more of that in, in like museum spaces and exhibitions yeah i think so yeah because i think obviously your senses are so hardwired into your memories like as soon as you mentioned like the smell of brook there i i could i felt like i could smell it i haven't got that link to northern soul but i think that it's more and more of that experience, isn't it? Yeah, it's ingrained. Yeah. yeah so the the jukebox, I called it time machine because it is kind of it's like you're being transported back to another time. Mm -hmm. Music has this strange ability to to spread out time in a way. Yeah. Because when you put it on, you're engaging with someone's memories, and it takes you back to another time when people were different, and they were different people, and the scene was different. And in in that sense. It's a timeline of social history as well, isn't it then? Because I, I guess all those memories, it's detailing all the things that have come through, lots of generations and, and different things that have been really important to people's lives. And it, I think so, yeah. Yeah, and it, it, it mix, it's mixing like oral histories into it with, yeah. with music, and I think that's the power of art. Art has this ability to kind of reveal things that either get forgotten or, or shoved under the carpet as, as, as insignificant, but actually when you pull them out, they are really quite significant parts of local history. I think I was just going to ask, obviously you've spoken about how a lot of your work is rooted in community. And I think one of the real strengths of the Northern Soul scene is the community. And I was just wondering what you kind of think that these anniversary celebrations mean to the people who were so involved in the scene and still are to this day. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, you'll you'll think, notice that Rosie asks the good questions and I, yeah, I, and yeah. I ask them all wrong. Uh, the probing <laughs> question. I think I think everybody's elated, aren't they? You know, that the fact that it's fifty years, you know, we're going back to time again, it's hard to believe that it's fifty years since since Wigan Casino opened. And so many songs refer to that idea of time passing by, you know, the Wigan three before eight is about, you know, time's gonna pass you by. But I think most people who I've spoken to are kinda thrilled you know to celebrate it and well you just have to look at that weekend's northern soul calendar it's jam-packed mm. with events everywhere you know there's this new generation now of young young dancers and northern soulies who are kind of taking it on board and adding to it their their new contemporary perspective on, on what, what northern soul is because it's not just it's not the same as it were yeah 50 years ago mm. And I think one of the great things about, just to plug our, our events for the 50th anniversary, one of the great things about those is that the students from Wigan and Lee College are getting involved in the young souls. So it's it's kind of bringing those generations together, I think. Yeah, and, and I think it's great that a lot of the older generation of soulies are embracing this, this, this new transformation which is occurring that these young people are bringing to it and keeping it alive. You know, and events like this with the Time Machine and, and the, the 50th anniversary programme, that, that strengthens that, that bond that that genre has got to this particular place. Everyone, everyone associates Northern Salt with the casino in Wigan. Then it's such a huge part of like Wigan's tradition, isn't it? Like you say, it's the, it's the thing that most people that have never been to Wigan would associate us with, with Northern Soul. We're not from Wigan, you might be able to tell from our accents, but yeah, as soon as you start, you start to work in Wigan you, you, and Northern Soul's are always there in, in like the things that people talk about, it's in the history of the buildings and you learn very quickly, don't you, about, about the casino. So it's really exciting that we're marking the, the big anniversary in, in this way. I was just going to ask, the, so again, complete opposite to Rosie's probing questions here. What I wanted to know about when you were going through the process, did you get involved in the, did you do some of the dancing? I did, yeah. You did. How did you find yeah. that? Well, I've got a bad back. <laughs> but I did, I haven't danced for a long time. But as a young person, as a teenager, I used to dance, I used to enjoy, really enjoy dancing. So I kind of embraced the lessons. And also I, I said to the young people, you know, if you, if you have a go, I'll join in. And so I, yeah, I was enjoying it. 
quite a lot and I learned a few moves and yeah. But the moves are, it looks like you see the footage of, of the moves and like some of the, like the still images of the poses that people have on the on the dance floor they're, they're iconic aren't they yeah. but they look complicated yeah. well it makes me i wouldn't be able to it energetic move. doesn't it energetic yeah <laughs> well, like... it does doesn't it the, the, the strange thing i i've always found is if you were to kind of cut off the screen and just look at the top of their bodies the yeah. top half mm -hmm. they're kind of just floating along and then if you looked at the bottom half their legs are kind of frantically moving have you tried it <laughs> no <laughs> i was just because i always look at it and that requires a degree of coordination that yeah I, yeah i just don't think i would have so but, I mean, you never know. Like, me and Rosie might get to where we go when the... When the programme. When the programme pulls back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember very early on after coming to work in Wigan, so we're talking, like, more than 10 years ago now, and I went to watch... I was at a Latix match. Yeah. And they play some... They, they uh, play it when you go in, They play they? some Northern yeah. Soul, don't they? But yeah. Pre-match. And I remember being stood up, and there was, a, there was a, an older couple a few rows down from me, and they were just silently... They weren't, they weren't looking at each other, but they were both in sync doing the little moves yeah like the, the feet shuffles and things and doing little bits of the obviously something that they'd been doing for decades together at, at different venues but it was almost like just because the, the track came on their the legs started it's moving instinct. it was instinct yeah because yeah. yeah. they weren't they weren't talking about it or even you know like they, they just they were in sync with each other but without even you know knowing it almost yeah it's ingrained yeah. yeah, I was going to ask as well because you mentioned again before we we started recording about it. So you you organised your own uh, an all nighter. How did you find that? Because I I'm going to say from the outset, I don't think I would be able to cope with an all nighter these days. <laughs> no, as as the organiser, I felt obliged to stay, yeah. <laughs> and I did manage it. But it was interesting as an observer of of that all nighter experience, you know, with the DJs because they were all well known DJs from from the UK, and the crowd was really busy in the early hours and then it slowly diminished and then some people came in from clubs in Manchester mm. so the crowd changed again and then I think there was about seven or eight young souls still there but what was interesting was the DJs never lost their energy regardless of how many people were there they were kind of still you know talking over the, the microphone with such energy and mm. passion as if there were 5,000 people there it was great but they're kind of in their own little space, depending mm. what comes on. You know, they've got the talcum powder and they've got a towel, yeah. and, you know, and, and they're dancing on their own, which is quite interesting, cool. I think. For me, it just looks so expressive and cathartic seeing them dance. So even if they are in their own sort of space, you can kind of see it on them, can't you? Yeah, I was thinking about that on the way over this morning. They say that it gets you in here, don't they? When we were being taught how to dance, he used to say, you know, you've got to feel it. You've got to feel it inside. In other words, you've got to get into the rhythm and also get into your heart and really dance like there's nobody watching, which is quite difficult. Yeah. But when it happens, it is quite liberating to dance purely just you and the music in, in your place, Wigan. I mean, that's, yeah, they, they were really privileged to be around at that particular time, I think. Yeah. And if I, if I had a real time machine, mm. eh, we could just all go back and, and actually do it. Yeah. So it's definitely not a real time machine. You well, know, just that's to... why I didn't call it the time machine. Because, <laughs> you know, I'm not Doctor Who. <laughs> <laughs> so how would people get involved in your piece, William? So the time machine consists of 50 records and 50 memories and those memories can be changed constantly according to what the community sends to me. So if you want to participate in the project or be a part of that time machine then all you need to do is to send me a memory that you've got attached to your, your time as a member of the soul community. And so, yeah, email them to me at northernarts at hotmail.com. Yeah, so that exhibition will be open from the 21st of September for a month, won't it? In there, there's some fantastic photos from Dean Chalkley, work from students from Wigan and Lee College, as I mentioned, and then outdoors as well on Standish Gate, we've got a, a fab photo exhibition that features images from the last night at the casino from Francesco Molina. So definitely don't miss out. It's going to be great. William, thanks very much for coming in, and I'm still... I'd say I maybe was like 20, 
80 in favour of trying to get involved with some of the dancing, but what I might do is just make Rosie go to the all-nighter <laughs> and do it instead. <laughs> yeah, I'm tempted to go, but only for a couple of hours. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see you there. <laughs> <laughs> That was another fun one, Rosie. I feel like we got we got into it a little bit there about Northern Soul. Yeah, I do have to say, I think my stamina has been slightly overestimated with the all-nighter. Yeah, I, and I, I don't think... I Well, I've got a very strict no-dance policy. I got a bit excited there saying that I, there was even a 20% chance of me getting up on the on the line with the talc. But we'll, we'll see. You never know, Rosie. We might be uh, slipping and sliding around <laughs> at the all-nighter. Oh, but, we could just leave it to the experts. Yeah, let, absolutely. Well said. Yeah, let's leave it, leave that one to the experts. But no, it's it's a great programme of events coming up, isn't it? And uh, such cultural significance to the borough. So we're going to go into the adverts and then we're going to come back with my chat with Derek Beaumont. Swig and Vera has so many independent businesses right on your doorstep waiting for you to explore. These local gems offer the very best in food and drink, fashion, gifts and much more. Celebrate local, love local. Visit wigan.gov.uk forward slash support local. Welcome back to the Borough Life podcast. Uh, it, it's James here. I'm with Derek Beaumont. Derek, we're at the LSV. All the preps being made for tonight's match against Wakefield. How are you feeling? Yeah, I always love game day. It's, it's always a bit tense. I'm not normally here this time on game day. But it's certainly worth uh, popping in and have a chat to you guys. So it's always good watching the band get set up in the stage. And you see sometimes you don't realise how much work goes into it. But the staff here behind the scenes, so it's interesting seeing how early they get it all done. Yeah, and they're setting the big screens up and the mowers are out on the pitch. So yeah, all set up for tonight. But I, think, I don't think people would, would like it if I didn't take you back a month or so back yeah. to the, the Challenge Cup. And I'm sure you don't mind talking about yeah. it as well. Yeah. I just For me... We're about a month on now. Is, is it settled in, everything that happened? The fact that you, you challenge cup winners and just that, that whole week? Yeah, it, it kind of has. And again, part of it kind of hasn't. I think I need a time where I can just sit down and watch it. And, and I haven't re- it took me over a week to reply to messages. Mm. It was that much of a burnout. And we didn't immediately celebrate it. Or certainly me and my wife and Lammy, we paid respect to the 1895, which was yeah. sponsor because it got played after it, then with the big party, then with the big homecoming. So it, it, it was kind of all just a, a blast and a blur. Yeah. But it's just been the best time in my life. It's been unbelievable. So of everybody else has felt is, you know, the tears that you saw and tears of joy, tears of happiness. And we're doing a good job now. We're getting the cup around as many places and people as we can. Yeah, I mean, that, I was going to mention, I think I saw, I was looking back at like some of the archive stuff when you came in to, you know, to help the club. I think you gave an interview where you said like the Challenge Cup was, was the one, like that was, yeah. that was the ambition. Yeah. So again, can you quite believe it that, you know, that you, you set that out and now it's happened? But I guess you need a bit of time for it to, to sink yeah, in. Yeah, it was surreal. I mean, I've always had this sort of dream. I've always visualised myself walking the team out of Wembley and I never, in, in the dream, I never ever see what happens. I don't know who we were playing. I, I just walk out. So when we got in the 1895 final, I thought, oh, it must be, it must be that. And obviously that was played at Tottenham. So I was like, oh. So this year when we got in, I'd always, my target had always been, we won 21, 71. So I was like 21. And obviously COVID completely disrupted yeah, that, yeah. along with everything else in life. So the presentation to the boys before the first round when we got involved Wakefield away was COVID's took two years out of everything. So really it is 21. It's our time. We've got it. To do it. And we really bought into this big vision and journey. And that was an incredible game. Yeah, yeah. So I was really relieved and just chuffed to be going there. I genuinely was. I was like, that's it. I get to walk the team out of Wembley. I don't know whether we win. That's mm. never been part of the dream. It's never been part of the ambition. And everybody said to me, yeah, but when you get there, you'll want to win it. And they're damn right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, again, like the the way that you won it as well, like it wasn't, you know, it wasn't by like, you know, 10 or 12 points where you could have a bit of a relax the last yeah. 20 minutes. I mean, talk us through that, like the the, the your emotions that like as, as the, the ball was sailing over yeah. the post. It was just, the, the whole thing was crazy because of how we did it. Yeah. Uh, and that's in terms of the application towards it, because I promised all the boys if we did, we take the fourth floor in the Hilton like the, the England team do. We'll, we'll escort your families down there on coaches. We'll put them up in accommodation. We'll throw a party, win or not party, because it's a celebration in itself. Mm. So 
there was so much emotion and time and planning went into the whole thing literally on the coach on the way down there the magnificent send-off that we got set the emotions massively high mm. here at LSV and, and, and the whole thing was sort of just building 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 and also Duke's he's always sat beside him he said listen about four minutes to go I said come on we need to go down because we've got to be there when yeah when it happens we want to be part of that moment um, and he's like you can't go yet you, you just can't go yet anything can happen yet well, I'm trying it and you're going to look an idiot down there it got to about two and a half minutes and I said if we don't go now we won't get the I'm going and he went yeah yeah we've got it and you go through a little room it's where the presentation party like go down so I know about it from the 1895 cup and he was putting the ribbons on for us the, the wow. and gold up, yeah. and setting the medals ready to come out on the tray and we're buzzing through and jumps in the lift goes down cheeks he grabs me and went we've just won the challenge cup we've won the challenge cup and I was like, oh my God, how good is this? And then the lift opened and as we're going to the tunnel, we had a massive roar. Yeah. And I was like, you're kidding me. So I never even saw the trial on the screen. Yeah, you were just in the in the depths of the stadium. And yeah. Getting, oh, wow. And then I thought, what am I doing stood here? I'm going to look like a ride. And of course, yeah. I get a bit of hammer on socials. I don't mind it. We have banter. Yeah, yeah. So I thought, I am going to get absolutely pegged here now if, if this is a loss. And in rugby, momentum's so big. So I knew our boys would feel deflated and I knew that they would feel like we've got these now, we've just took it off mm. them. And I kind of felt whoever got the first crack at the drop goal would, would be it. So I was just in no man's land. I was like, where do I go? Mm. You know, kind of stood there in a full clad leopard suit thinking, oh God, what's happening here? And I thought, reset your emotion here because I've gone from, oh, I'm going to react if we win. So I'm going to react if we lose. Yeah, prefer yeah. for both, so that you yeah. act professionally. Obviously, not if you win; it just goes crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just unbelievable. The scenes were just unbelievable. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, unbelievable is the word, isn't it? I, I just following on from that uh, topic because we could talk about that day for for hours, but unfortunately yeah. for our listeners, we haven't got uh, too much time. So I just I, I'll fast forward then. The next day, more unbelievable scenes. So, from your so I, I was in the the middle of it trying to get footage for us of like yeah. you guys coming in on the bus and like how was that for you? Did it, I know that would you were you kind of expecting it up to a point, but then the, the amount of people there and 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 everything, the atmosphere, did that yeah. kind of surpass your expectations? Completely blew us away. It was a bit of a lesson in in some ways as well as to because you know we don't. Everybody has their part to play, don't they, in making an occasion big. And and very often I'm someone who'll just go, right, let's do this. So I just think, let's get an open top buzz and drive around with the trophy. People like the, at the council think, damn that, I mean, we're going to have to shut some roads, there'll be loads of people, we're going to need barriers, we're going to need police, we're going to need this. I don't think one minute about any of that. And what they did for the time that day, the council is, you know, absolutely outstanding. It couldn't be bettered. And we were so, so proud by it, but blown away by it, genuinely mm. by the people. So it had been perfectly planned. And I'm thinking, what? Well, you know, that made me think, like, how many people are we talking here? And part of the presentation, we'd shown all these pictures from 71, the buzz, the square at the town hall being flooded. Yeah. And when we arrived at Astley, I expected wherever there's a pub, a few people will come outside. And then when we get to we we'll probably get something really big. We got to Astley, it was massive. And we was like, wow. Everyone was like, oh my God, like, you know, the amount of people that turned out. And it, it literally carried on. People in the gardens, people mm. sat outside the rises. Everyone was just yeah, on yeah. the streets, literally. Yeah. And then we got into Tilsley, and that was rammed. And then we come through into Atherton, that was rammed, mm. but even more so. And it was like, the closer we got, the madder it got. And I remember they stopped the buzz somewhere just round about before the Thomas Burke. Um, and the, the security guys, some of them got out and, and walked in front and it went in slow. And the scenes, yeah, it, it was crazy, the, the, the scene that you see from the buzz. It was the most unbelievable thing. Uh, th that experience was bigger, genuinely, than the actual final minute of winning the cup. That, that, that whole thing on that buzz is just the, the best thing I've ever done. It, yeah, it, I mean, t yeah, to be in the middle of that, myself and Rosie were, were in the in the thick of it getting the like the the content for the council and yeah it was it was amazing but it was just so like good natured and yeah. so many smiles on faces yeah. so many ages as well like you know right from like little 
little kids wearing the yeah. leopard print up up to like you know yeah, kind yeah. of pensioner age and it really like it's things like that that bring the community together isn't it and I, and, yeah. I, and I know as well that it's one that the, the club rugby leagues built on its you know sense of community isn't it as you say the values of it and it's days like that just prove how how important it is to yeah, to to the, it really, it, it's something for the town to enjoy and buy into and be proud of. And it's been over 50 years, mm. you know. So a lot of people there, there, there were some good stories where fathers and sons yeah. who'd gone when they were young and they were say my age and now they're like older and they've got the grandkids. So there was actually three generations. That was a great story. But I think what was fabulous, like for, from us and the players, we spoke about it, when we're looking down just the vast amount of people, everyone was like, wow, wow, wow. Mm. And the leopard print that was around everywhere and that's what I love about it because you don't have to buy a replica shirt and not everybody can you can literally just buy some fun ears leopard ears for a quid or a bracelet or a t-shirt for three quid off on the internet and you're part of it and everybody had kind of done that and that was kind of good because it showed some some pre-belief in it all we reckon there was over 40,000 people mm. I think the council said they clicked 15,000 into the square. Yeah, yeah. Which is just incredible because that's more than we've ever, yeah. ever had here. Mm. And then to get on the stage and and the moment really for me, it's going to be tough. But we, we ended up in the, the, the sort of civic ring, I'm not sure what you call it at the top. And you've got the big sort of yeah, magistrates yeah. sort of feel of the, yeah. the chairs and everyone sat in there holding as well. Things were cleared and, yeah. and, and planned. And I just said to all the lads, I said, Guys, you've just seen what like the most amazing scenes, like amazing scenes, like they far exceeded what we thought and what we showed you and, and everything. And they're all like, yeah. And I was like, and that's doing something that's been be done before, albeit 52 years ago, it has been done before. And that was the reaction. I said, we've got an opportunity now of doing something that's never been done before. And can you imagine if we made a grand final and won that and we've got the double, like, we would have to close the time mm. so we kind of challenged ourselves with it a little bit and and we, we we're currently you know if we win tonight the chance we're fourth and we'd give ourselves a chance of it so. absolutely i just wanted to bring you back it's coming up to about a year now since the the rebrand yeah. and you kind of touched on it then because i thought the same when i was there at the homecoming and and at the uh you know the the, the sending off um kind of parade that we did before you went down to wembley it is striking the amount, you know, the people who have bought into it and, and have the, like, you know, you can have the leopard skin and leopard print. Um, would it be fair to say when you made that announcement last year, it raised a few eyebrows, didn't it? You yeah, know, yeah. But it, I think people can see now why, the reasons yeah. behind it. If I do something, I do it because I believe in it. Yeah, so yeah. then I have courage in my convictions to do it and yeah. see it through because I'm doing it for the right reasons. Uh, and it didn't just come off a whim. You know? yeah. There was a lot of thought and process and and planning and I knew that not everybody would like it I was surprised by the fact that I felt the older fans would be the ones most opposed mm -hmm. and the younger ones most happy with it actually it was the other way around right. the older guys didn't really care because they never saw it as Centurions until it rebranded in 95 as, as right that. so I knew that you know I wasn't from day one I wasn't like yes this is 100% blah 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 so it had to grow on me and everybody else. And as we discussed it, and we worked for so long with the different logos and different things. So it grows on you. And I think the moment where I knew it had been accepted and would work was about two or three weeks after we'd launched it to the media. We did a relaunch to the fans. And so we needed to be different from the red and white stripes, from the Centurion Warrior. It was all too much, you know, the same. And I thought it, it gives us that opportunity. And I said to everybody, listen, whether you like this logo or you don't still, three weeks on, if you like it more now than you did then, put your hand up. And every single person in the room put their hand up. Yeah, yeah. And, and that kind of told me it's going to take time to grow on people. Yeah. But also what's got to be mentioned here is the performances on the field from the boys, the success, the winning has, has, has helped breed yeah, it and make it more yeah. accepting. yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's probably exceeding my ex expectations as to how quick and how well it's been received externally. And, and now it, it, it's bedding in. And, you know, I also think there's an opportunity. We're creating some new fans from it. Yeah. So what it does provide is opportunity. You'll see there how we're, we're keeping our heritage and culture in amongst it all still. 
and like and then the whole package like with you know with the kind of the references to the, the leopard's den and yeah you you've got an identity there haven't you that can yeah, yeah. That you can build on and and yeah. hopefully build on the you know the success on the pitch as well Derek, thanks very much for your time. Really appreciate it. Best of luck for the rest of the year. Yeah, lovely. Hopefully uh, we'll get a Wigan League Grand Final. We can talk again after that. Yeah, that'd be good, wouldn't it? (laughs) Well, another great episode, James. How did you find it? Yeah, it's been fun, hasn't it? It's been great being in the new podcast studio in the middle of Wigan Market and hopefully uh, many more to come. Rosie, we should mention that we've just started the process of putting together the Borough Life Winter Edition for this year. So we're just going through all the story ideas and creative content, are we? So it's an exciting bit of the year where we start thinking about it. If you'd like to know more about how we go through the process of putting Borough Life magazine together, I'll refer you back to episode three of the podcast where we spoke to Mark and Mel from our design team and Andrea as well, who's our one of our main writers. That's an interesting one to, to listen to. And we'll keep you updated as we go through the process. Yep, and if you want to check out Borough Life Plus, which is where we put all our digital online content, head to wigan.gov.uk forward slash Borough Life Plus, and of course, follow us on social media to keep up to date. If you are looking for details on any of our Northern Soul events, just head to visitwigan.com and you can see the full schedule there. Well, thanks for listening, guys. We'll see you again very soon.